I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. I have two special guests today. Kate Brown is a Mercer partner and the leader of our Center for Health Innovation. And Claire Mernier is the Chief Operating Officer of the Digital Medicine Society. And that is an organization that runs collaborations across the digital medical market. And IMPACT is their coalition focused on virtual first medical care, which is today's topic, virtual first care, also known as V1C. And um, you might know that our last health news interview was with Kate and Sam Espinosa, and it was an introduction to this topic of V1C. So if you missed it, you might want to check it out. But this is the concept of V1C. It's a care team with your provider, a coach, and all the technology coordinated and wrapped into one offering. It has the potential to be really big. So today we're going to roll up our sleeves and get into some specific actions for plan sponsors. We want to make it real for you. Kate, why don't you start us off and talk about why employer plan sponsors should be interested in this new model? What is the hook for them? Yeah, so first, thanks for having me, Tracy. Glad to be back. Uh, two quick things. So first up is that V1C models for care delivery are convenient, both for the patient and for the provider. And we know that individuals really look favorably upon virtual care. So Mercer's recent health on demand research demonstrated this. 80% of people who tried telemed during COVID said that they're gonna to continue to use it. So people like it, it's convenient, they want it. The second piece is that there's the potential for savings both for the employer and for the employee. And a lot of these emerging models are also recognizing that to fully drive the value that's inherent within virtual first care, there also needs to be this emphasis on value-based payment models. Now, certainly there's a lot of work to be done there, of course, but there's also a lot to be optimistic about for employers. Very interesting. So Claire, what are the benefits of V1C for plan sponsors? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think Kate did an excellent job um, highlighting the, the improvements in user experience, right? This kind, this kind of care is much more convenient. People can access it anytime, anywhere. Um, in terms of accessibility as well, from a geographic perspective, I think there's the opportunity to reach rural and urban with the exact same offering because these, these offerings are virtual. And so that enables greater scale and sort of benefits parity regardless of where your organization is operating. Um, Kate pointed to some of the economic pieces of this. And I think um, certainly from a, a cost perspective, there are opportunities for both employers as well as employees or patients themselves. Um, there's also a lot of efficiency that comes um, within the system of virtual first care because many of these models are thinking about about what we call um, care providers practicing at the top of their licenses, which just means that everyone is providing the care um, that they're sort of trained to provide. And, and rather than assuming that a physician needs to provide everything, um, virtual first care models say, you know, there could be coaches or there could be nurses and physicians in the mix. And so really matches the patient need to, to the level required. Um, and then last but not least, um, you know, better outcomes. Um, care can be provided in near real time when the person is having an issue. Um, again, multidisciplinary teams are working on things. So rather than one brain thinking about your health challenge, um, it's multiple. And that always leads to, to sort of better thinking and a, and a better um, sort of well-rounded approach to, to resolving a, a health issue or addressing it. And then last but not least, um, virtual first care providers um, are able to much more seamlessly integrate some of the novel components of healthcare coming down the pike, such as um, digital therapeutics and wearables, which allow us for um, better real-time measurement and proactive intervention, um, again, which serves those better outcomes. Hmm, interesting. So Claire, can you just describe what impact is working on specifically that will matter for employer plan sponsors? Absolutely. Um, and so this group really came together in February and identified some key challenges that they wanted to get to work on immediately. I think first and foremost um, was the need to really define what we mean when we say virtual first care and to really carve out the unique nature of these solutions that are their own standalone HIPAA covered entities bringing together the care team and the tech. Um, Second, we really um, wanted to focus on the breakdowns that happen in contracting with these solutions. 
And I'm sure for many of you, this is a, this is a challenge that you face where, you know, you identify a solution, you're very excited about it, but then you don't have a very good sort of contract template to initiate the next step. And so um, recognizing that the traditional provider um, contract doesn't contemplate all the tech components, um, the traditional tech vendor contract doesn't contemplate the care components. Um, what we've done here is launched a guide to contracting for payers in virtual first care solutions. Um, the cornerstone of which is really just a guide to contracting that goes through every section of the contract um, and has key considerations in each one of those areas. Um, we also produced um, a library of codes that um, all of the impact members are using to get reimbursed for their solutions, um, as well as a guide to payment models in virtual first care. We have a new work stream coming. Um, it's getting started actually this month, which we're really excited about, focused on care transitions. Um, and this was a priority that I think everybody is seeing as you know people go back somewhat to their brick and mortar, but they're still doing a lot of these virtual solutions. And rather than just have virtual first care as, yay, another silo in healthcare, um, there's a real opportunity here to understand the user experience between um, providers and patients and administrators um, to ensure that both both the people and the data are flowing smoothly. And so um, this work is expected to um, deliver um, in the spring of next year. And I think uh, we'll see great things from this group about ensuring that the user experience across care venues, um, be it a pharmacy or a home care experience or traditional brick and mortar um, or a virtual first care solution go well. So Claire, that's a lot of great information, lots of great resources. Kate, as you reflect on that, can you just talk specifically about how we can use all of this great information with our clients? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2020, and I think to some extent in 2021, we saw a lot of reactive implementation of virtual benefits. And recently that's really given way to a more strategic focus on how to get the best out of virtual and brick and mortar. And so we're, what we're starting to see is that employers are evaluating virtual primary care offerings and determining how those offerings are gonna intersect with traditional health plans that rely maybe heavily or exclusively on brick and mortar systems. So really there's this shift to a more strategic questioning of what can virtual first care do for me and how does that align to my business objectives? Um, and I think the other thing we're seeing is that our most progressive employers have really pushed their vendor partners for deeper integration in service of a better user experience in healthcare. And it can't just be the, the few employers that are large that have the scale to drive that change, really, right? It needs to be really the entire employer market saying, this needs to be the table stake. This needs to be how the vendors integrate with one another, and this is how it should work. And that's really what the work is that Impact is doing, right? They're creating really the system for all of this to happen at scale. And we're moving one step closer to a more efficient system through this work. So to build on that concept of employers driving the market and all of us kind of asking for the same thing, Claire, for any of our listeners that want to be an early adopter or they just want to get started, they want to jump on the bandwagon and help drive the market, who should employers be talking to about this and what should they be asking for? Yeah, this is a great question. And um, I imagine many of you are having, um, you know, being approached by various virtual first care solutions wanting to talk. But the most important thing I would encourage you to do is to look across your population. What, what are your employees' greatest needs? What are the biggest cost drivers? Um, and to really start there. And I would say, um, you know, we see some arenas in the virtual first care space that are more mature, such as mental health and diabetes. Um, and we certainly have groups like um, Ginger Headspace Health, uh, as well as Omada, who are, who are working in that space. Um, we're also seeing an increasing trend of specialty care being provided through virtual first care. And so um, just a few impact members um, who are working, you know, Cove on migraines, um, picnic and allergies, heartbeat health and cardiovascular disease, um, OSHI health and GI chronic conditions such as Crohn's and colitis, um, as well as Vasana and 
women's health and endometriosis. So um, lots of specialty care happening here. And I would say these groups are bringing um, a very robust, almost more robust than what we might see in diabetes or, or mental health, um, more robust care team to the table, um, more complex solutions. Um, and, and they're coming quite quickly. They're leveraging the experience of, of some of the groups that came before them. Um, they're getting immense amounts of funding um, and moving quite quickly to scale their solutions. So Kate, same question for you. Who should employers be talking to and what should they be asking for? So I'll, I'll answer the second part of the question around what should they be asking for? Because as Claire just illuminated for us, there is no shortage of offerings in the market today, right? There are so, so many spaces in which these solutions are emerging. And a few of them are, are more mature than others, but regardless, there's no reason that employers shouldn't begin to try to think about how to implement these new things. So certainly step one, like Claire said, is think about your population and the needs and cost drivers that exist. That's always step one in consulting, right? Figure out the problem that you're solving. But beyond that, you don't have to solve every problem all at once and you're not gonna solve it for every population. So think about piloting. And before you think, oh, that's maybe not a great thing, I, I'm intimidated by piloting. You know, a lot of employers really did that during COVID naturally. So keep harnessing that momentum, keep your agility, keep your flexibility, and really apply that into these new spaces of specialty care and think about piloting some of those solutions that Claire just highlighted. Um, and then to get maybe a little bit more tactical, Tracy, or, or maybe for those folks who think pilot is a dirty word, um, I would at least encourage employers to be asking their vendors or carrier partners, who owns the data and how is the data flowing, right? It's so important that the data flows appropriately because ultimately that's going to be used against the patient and consumer experience. And if you don't have that data, how are you going to answer the question as the plan sponsor? What value is this program creating? So I'm not going to go so far, Tracy, as to craft an RFP question, but hopefully that gives employers on the line a, a little hint as what to, to focus on. Okay, that was very helpful. Kate and Claire both, thank you so much for joining. This was a super interesting discussion. I can hardly wait to have you back and hear more about the developments and how things are going. And so thank you for joining us today. Thanks for thank having you. me. Great to be here. We'll see everyone next time. Thank you. Thank you.